a very good evening to one and all. And on behalf of the National Academy of Sciences, India Delhi chapter, and the India Alupadhyay College University of Delhi, I welcome all of you. And special thanks to Professor Ted G. Shepherd, who has joined us from UK. So he's a Grantham Professor of Climate Science, Department of Meteorology, University of Reading, UK. And he'll be today enlightening us on a very interesting and very relevant topic, uh, like making sense of climate change at the local scale. So I really would like to thank uh, Professor Shefford for accepting our request to deliver a talk in this virtual board. So before inviting uh, Professor Shefford to deliver his talk, let me briefly introduce him to all of you. He did his BSc in Mathematics and Physics from University of Toronto in 1979 and PhD in Metrology from MIT in 1984. After a postdoctoral fellowship with Marshall McAleer from DMTP University of Cambridge, he took up a faculty position in the Department of Physics at the University of Toronto in 1988. He was promoted to full professor in 1996. In the early part of his career, he pioneered the application of Hamiltonian dynamics to geophysical fluid dynamics. Subsequently, he turned his attention to the dynamics of the Earth's middle atmosphere, that is stratosphere and mesosphere, where he became a leading authority on middle atmosphere dynamics and climate modeling and chemistry climate interactions. In this capacity, he led for 20 years the highly successful university government collaboration to develop and use the Canadian middle atmosphere model, that is CMAM, creating an entirely new research community in Canada. The CMAM received a number of notable firsts and was widely regarded as one of the leading chemistry climate models in the world. He has also played a key role in the WMO UNEP ozone assessments for the year 1998, 2002, 2006, 2010, and 2014, as well as, as the IPCC TEAP special report on ozone and climate in the year 2005, and was a review editor for the IPCC for five years, that is from 2001 to 2005. He was the chief editor of the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences, the leading journal in fundamental atmosphere science. He has won the top awards of the Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society, that is the President's Prize in 1995, and was the Meteorological Service of Canada, the year 2005, as a fellow of the CMOS, the American Meteorological Society, the American Geophysical Union, the Royal Society of Canada, and the Royal Society. In the year 2014, he was honored as a Thomson Reuters highly cited researcher. With these words, I now invite Professor Shefford to kindly share his screen to deliver his talk. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, now, for some reason, uh, okay. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see that. Very good, okay, thank you very much. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, uh, it's a bit sur surreal still to be giving a talk halfway around the world, but uh, becoming more common. So I'll be talking about climate change at, at, at the local scale. And um, sorry, I always get the first click wrong. Now, uh, I just wanted to start. It was actually quite a, a, a surprise to a lot of us when the Nobel Prize in Physics was announced uh, just a few months ago in including climate change. And uh, because there's uh, climate has always felt a little uncomfortable with within the area of physics, and I think this basically endorsed it as a problem in physics. And the um, the citation overall was for groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of complex systems. Climate is a complex system. The two climate scientists, the the citation is for them together. But I just this is the, the these are my own words, Suki Manabe. Uh, who uh, a Japanese who spent his career in the U.S. Uh, for basically laying the foundation for the development of the physical climate models, and Klaus Hasselmann, a German, for understanding how weather noise leads to climate variability, and for the idea of fingerprinting climate changes due due to external variability as a way of the externally forced as opposed to the internally generated signals. And then there was a physicist, a, a kinesthetic theorist, Giorgio Parisi, for, for the discovery of interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical systems. I didn't actually know his work, but I'm aware of a lot of the work in complex systems and physics, and that this is the diagram. 
the the uh, figure from the from the Nobel Committee's um, uh, 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 description. It shows that if you take a, a disordered system and you compress it, the the the, the form that it the, the 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 nature that it takes exactly how the pattern arises the uh, varies from time to time. And so my interpretation of this um, is that. It, it's a chaotic system and the evolution of a chaotic system can be understandable without being fully predictable because it depends on many contingent factors. You see this kind of formation actually in nature in ge 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 geological uh, formations. There's a famous one not far from me called the Giant's Causeway uh, in Northern Ireland. I'm sure you have similar ones uh, in your part of the world. So let me jump to the heart of the matter. When you talk about climate risk, there's three, three aspects that people talk about. The first is the, what we would call internal variability or the chaos, external, uh, uh, sorry, extreme weather and climate events. We know that extreme weather and climate events happen just by chance. We have storms, we have droughts and so on. And that will always happen just because of chaos. And that's part of the risk. But then we have the changes in the possible weather and climate states. You can think of that as being climate change itself. From a statistical point of view, you would uh, think of climate as being the set of all possible weather and climate states. You might define that through a probability distribution, let's say. And it's a change in that, in that probability di di distribution that represents climate change. It's, it's not just the average, including all, all the fluctuations. And then the third aspect um, of involving climate risk is the, the human Ability to to a wildfire or flooding or a heat wave and so on. Now, in climate science, we like we like to have, to come up with probabilities. So uh, the the classic definition of a probability is considered to be what's called aleatoric. That's a Latin term meaning a chance, a roll of the dice, basically, and that's sometimes known as frequentist. You just count frequencies. So. You could talk about a one in 10 year event is an event that has a chance of happening once every 10 years. So that, that is a way of describing the internal variability, um, but it is not a way to describe the changes in the possible weather and climate states because that's just climate change itself. And it's certainly no way to talk about uh, human managed uh, aspects. So the standard language we have for talking about probability is really only appropriate, uh, sorry, probability is only appropriate uh, for the internal variability. And even then, if you've got the most extreme events, the very, very rare events, it's not obvious how you would define a probability. The second aspect, the change, uh, climate change itself is subject to known as what is called epistemic uncertainty. It's uncertainty in knowledge, or you can think of it as systematic uncertainty. From a classical measurement point of view, the, the, the variability is a random component of uncertainty and the, and the systematic part, which is here the climate change is the structural or the systematic uh, uncertainty. Of course, there's uncertainty in what the future concentrations of greenhouse gases are gonna be, which are called the climate forcing. But even if you specify the climate forcing as you do in a climate model, there's still uncertainty in how the climate system responds. And then the third, the human managed aspect is, of course, is also uncertain. And the decisions that, that are going to be made uh, are that that has its own framework, I call it the, the, the decision space. So somehow the information has to be cast in the decision space. So ultimately, that, all that means, that it, what that means is that probability is what is sometimes called degree of belief, which is a bit uncomfortable term to most climate scientists. Um, and in fact, you, you can define probability in terms of the pro proclivity or the tendency to action. There are actually theories of pro probability based on that. Uh, and that's ne necessary to be thinking in the decision space. But both of those things, of course, are su su subjective. They'll be different for different people. There's no correct answer. It's, it's very, it's very co contextual. So the challenge in, in, in describing and making sense of climate change is to, is to develop a language, a scientific language for meaningfully representing and communicating this complex web of uncertainty where there's some components you can think of as a chance event and you can use the, 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 the standard uh, frequentist type probabilities, but other aspects are much more subjective.
And we have to combine also multiple lines of evidence. We have climate models and observations and theory. I'll talk about that. And we have to combine those in some way and extend it into the decision space. So in a way, this is an outline of the whole, of the whole talk. I'll start to uh, unpack this now and, and go into the different elements, but this is the, the heart of the matter. Now, um, I'll be talking about st storylines and storytelling and narratives. And you might ask, can, can a narrative provide a scientific evidence for de decision-making? Well, I think so. Um, this is an apoc apocryphal story of a conversation uh, in March, 2020. I say uh, apocryphal because the source is not necessarily a trusted source. You will uh, remember that of course, March was when the COVID epidemic was really starting to take off in Europe. So you probably recognize the, this gentleman, this is our prime, prime minister, and his advisors said to him on the 18th of March, we have to have an emergency meeting because COVID is getting out of hand and we have to think about what we're gonna do in Britain. And he said, I'm gonna see the queen. That's what I do every Wednesday. I see the queen every Wednesday, saw it. I'm gonna go and see her. And this advisor supposedly said, you can't go and see the queen. What if you go and give her coronavirus? And apparently, according to this advisor, he said, yeah, you're right, I can't go. So the penny dropped. He realized based on this narrative that he couldn't go. So I think that there is great power in narratives and actually making a decision. You finally see things in great clarity. What would, it, what would his reputation, I'm not saying that our prime minister necessarily had the best, best of intentions, but he realized that his reputation would be uh, quite bad if, if, if he gave the queen, uh, who's very elderly, of course, uh, coronavirus. Now, one of the topics uh, that, that I won't delve into too much, but is, is um, part of the issue, I think, is talking about statistical significance. I talked about frequentist-based uh, um, uh, uh, ways of talking about probability, and that is uh, re related to what are known as frequentist methods. And this is a Nature editorial. Nature, of course, is a very high-profile journal, and they three years ago, they uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, editorials and efforts to, to reform statistical practice. They say we should ditch, get rid of statistical significance. They say it would make science harder, but better. Now, an obvious point is that a p-value of point less than 0 0.05, which is the usual measure of statistical significance should not be interpreted dichotomously as true false. And uh, that's this point of course has been made many, many, many times over many years. I won't really um, go into that here. But the issue runs much deeper than that. And in particular in climate change science, it's anchored in physical understanding. But the frequentist um, statistical practices, which absolutely dominate published climate sci science are incompatible with physical understanding. There's no framework to connect them. So this creates a disconnect between physical reasoning and statistical pra practice. I have a paper I, that came out in the, in the fall um, uh, autumn in climatic change journal. Uh, you can find it on my website uh, easily um, for discussion. So I won't talk about that anymore. Um, the other topic is ca causality. Now, causality is not usually discussed in statistics books. If you look at the uh, the classic textbooks in atmospheric and climate science, you 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 you, you do not find the word anywhere. But of course, causality is the heart of of, of physics. So how does that disconnect happen? So what happens is that when, when climate scientists use, use statistical uh, analysis, in the back of their mind, they have uh, understanding of ca causality um, involved in a particular situation for setting up the analysis and for interpreting the, the results. So the mathematics is agnostic about ca causality, but the physical interpretation is not. So there's been quite a move to bring ca causality into uh, statistics is called causal statistics. Judea Burl and Pearl, an artificial intelligence uh, a researcher at UCLA, has been one of the pioneers in this. And he, he works in artificial intelligence, as I said. And of course, there it's important for ca causality because if you program your, your robot to do something, you want it, it, it to do the right thing. Um, this is a popular ver version, uh, a, a popular book uh, on, on his work. He's got very mathematical books too, but this is the book of why it's called. It's a very, very good book. I, I highly recommend it. Um, just to illustrate uh, things here um, and um, in a very simple setup, we have three variables, X, Y, and Z. 
and in the in they're represented in this diagram in the lower uh, right. So the idea is that um, X influences Y and Z influences Y, and X and Z are correlated. The correlation coefficient is R, the subscript ZX. Maybe you you can see my see my mouse. So we have a correlation between X and Z, but X affects Y and Z affects Y. So if you use a a linear model, you you can make a nonlinear version of this. But if you use a linear model, it's called multiple linear re regression. You regress uh, the 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 predictive vari variable y against the explanatory variables x and z, and that's shown by by, by 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 this equation. So the model is that you have a prediction of y that's a, a linear combination of x and z for any particular um, uh, uh, instant or time or, or However, you're collecting your, your data. They have regression co coefficients, which are constants. These betas here, sorry for the no notation, which is maybe a little cumbersome. It's meant to be the, the, the regression of y on x in the presence of z and y on z in the presence of x. And then you have noise, of course. And then if you just, it's very simple algebra that if you correlate y with x, then you get the correlation coefficient of y and x has, is the sum of the regression coefficient of y on x time plus the regression coefficient of y and z times the correlation. If you don't follow the mathematics, don't worry about it. Um, uh, uh, the important thing is, is to get the gist. And the idea is that the correlation between x and y reflects a direct effect of x on y, which is this beta y x comma z. But there's also a, a, an indirect pathway, which 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 goes via z, and so this is it's it's a product of these two terms. This is a special case of what's known as the path tracing rule. Pearl discusses many more complex setups, but the the thing is that the the uh, the uh, interpretation of this indirect pathway depends completely on the correlation, or sorry, on the causality between x and z. So if x is is influencing z, if the arrow goes from x to z then you can think of Z as being a mediator. In other words, the, the influence of X and Y occurs through a direct pathway and an indirect pathway via Z. And on the other hand, if the causal influence goes from X, Z to X, then you've got, then Z is a confounding variable. And that's actually a, a introducing what you usually think of as a spurious relationship. So whether it's a mediator or, or a, a, a confounder really matters in terms of the actions that you would take, the decisions you would take. So we, we talk about this also with, with Marlena Kretschmer, uh, a colleague of mine in a paper that just came out in the Bolton of the American Immunological Society in terms of teleconnections and give lots of examples of teleconnections around, around the climate system. So why do we need storylines? Um, we obviously need storylines, if you like, of the future um, uh, uh, of society and future uh, greenhouse gases and so on, but why do we need physical climate storylines? Well, the reason for that is that climate models can di disagree on the nature of the atmospheric circulation response to, go to global warming. That's, the, that's my own research area. So this gives four uh, results from the last, uh, um, uh, well, it's from the, the, what the models used for the previous IPCC assessment. This was in a perspective that I published a few, uh, almost 10 years ago now. These are four of the leading climate models. They show the winter time. So lower troposphere is just the lower part of the atmosphere, um, uh, just a few kil kilometers above the surface. It's the zonal wind spe speed. That's the wind from, from, from west to east. And the climatology, oh, so it's the wintertime season. The climatology or the average va uh, that values is shown in and the changes are shown. The changes are shown in the colors. And these are four of the leading models. The stippling just indicates that we're confident that that's the the, the result of that particular model. And you'll see this model here, the Canadian SM Canadian model actually uh, pre predicts a, a strengthening of the wind in 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 southern Europe and a weakening in northern Europe. But the American the Ankara model CCSM predicts all uh, completely different with a strengthening in in northern. You're, well, this is more Scandinavia, so it's a different pattern. Um, the Australian model gives something di di different again, and the and the European model, e EC Earth, gives something yet again different. So you've got very different responses, um, which some are plus, some, <laughs> some are minus. Every model predicts that there will be changes. 
but they all predict that, that different places and different signs. Obviously, if they average this kind of thing, you're going to get a very weak response, but that's not, not, not the expected response. So the average really has no meaning in this case because we're talking about spatial patterns, which can vary in their location. This has direct implications. The, this, the wintertime circulation in, in Europe is very much controlled by what's called the storm track and uh, has direct implications for precipitation and weather-related extremes and drought and in the summer heat waves. So just to give an example, this is with our colleague, Regina Rodriguez, who's in Brazil. And we, we discuss in, in this piece that we've just written, uh, the, uh, a, a compound event that affected Southeast Brazil in 2013, 2014 in their, in their, in their summer. And the, the a key, um, a source of moisture and rainfall, it, it's the South American monsoon. Of course, you have your own uh, South Asian monsoon, which is very important in your part of the world. Uh, in, here, it's a South American monsoon climatologically, which is to say, on average, the air flows off the Amazon and brings the moisture from the Amazon into this region, which is very important where a lot of people live uh, uh, and for agriculture. Um, but what happened in this in this in this uh, summer was there was an enormous anticyclonic circulation, which takes this form, which blocked that flow and led to drying. So there was a cut off the moisture supply, and because it was cl clear skies under the uh, anticyclonic circulation, there was a lot of solar insulation, and and a lot of heating of the surface. So there was a heat wave. And basically, it affected the whole food, water, energy nexus with uh, crop failures, failures of the fisheries because of warm ocean temperatures, uh, water reservoirs dried out, lack of hydropower. Classic example, it's called correlated risk. And the standard approach to deal with this, people say, was this event because of climate change? So there's a, a method known as probabilistic attribution, which takes a frequent dose type approach. And they found, it was published here, uh, they found insufficient evidence that climate change increased drought risk. This was the evidence on which they drew that conclusion. This is the drought risk. It's in a logarithmic scale relative to pre-industrial. So a value of one means that the drought, ri drought risk has not changed. A value greater than one, which is to, to, to the right here, would say that climate change has increased the, the risk of drought. A value less than one would mean that the climate change has decreased the, um, the drought risk. The observations, which is called G GPCC, uh, implies an increased drought risk, although the uh, uncertainty bars include one, so which would be no, no change. Um, the CMIP-5, which is the collection of all the different models from around the world, uh, for what they're worth, uh, also imply increased drought risk. But the two um, UK-based models, variants of the same model, actually, which they used in a study predicted decreased drought risk. So they pooled all the uh, all these four uh, error bars, and they said there was insufficient evidence um, that climate change included drought risk. But we can ask, insufficient for whom? What they meant was insufficient to reject the null hypothesis, which we, we, we know is a bad practice anyway. But if you were concerned, if you were a water manager or concerned about agriculture, or concerned about the power supply, I think you would not say this was insufficient evidence to worry about drought risk. So if you take a, 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 a traditional view and consider all the uncertainties in climate change in a traditional way, it leads to what's known, has been called a cascade of uncertainty. We have uncertainty in the future society that will affect our future greenhouse gas emissions, the climate models give different answers to what the nature of climate change will be at the regional scale. <clears throat> then you have a regional scenario for the socioeconomic conditions there. Then you have an impact model, local impacts and adaptation responses. And so there are these integrated assessment models that try to put this, put this all together, but you have this huge um, cascade of uncertainties. So we need to navigate through this somehow. <clears throat> That's where storylines come in. But I will say that even when aggregation is reliable, it is not informative about individual events. And this is a famous example, excuse me, <coughs> from Borkovitz uh, uh, in 1898. Um, so uh, in those days, uh, uh, the, the military, of course, uh, had cavalry units, horse um, units on horse, and there were lots of them. So lots and lots of horses. And uh, 
Prussia, which is, is northern Germany, had a very strong, uh, strong military. And so they had a lot of cavalry in it. So uh, Borkovitz, soldiers would die by, 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 by horse kicks. So Borkovitz collected the data <clears throat> on the number of the units, cavalry units, suffering a death of a soldier by horse kick in a given year. And you see that mostly a, a unit doesn't have any, anybody dying by horse kick. That, that's the most common outcome. And uh, so that was uh, on average 110 units, but then 60 units would suffer one death by horse kick and 20 units to suffer two deaths and so on. This is what's known, this follows this Poisson distribution. It's, 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 a, it's a theoretical distribution, a, a beautiful, beautiful example of a Poisson distribution. So in some sense, you would say that the deaths happen by chance. But I think if you were the commanding officer of one of these units and the family of one of the soldier that died came to you and asked about it, you would not just say they were, they were unlucky. It was by chance. You would think of all the things that you could have done that might have avoided that death. And we know that each death surely had a tragic story be, behind it. Everything does have a cause. So this sort of di di dialectic between aggregate and individual occurs across many disciplines. You find it in medicine, you, it's the difference between, let's say, a public health perspective, which is looking at the population in aggregate versus a clinical perspective, which is looking at a specific case. It happens in anthropology. I think it happens in pretty much a, a, every field. You get this um, sort of global uh, view of things, which is not necessarily invalid, but there's also the, the individual view. And the reason that um, uh, that this occurs is because events in the real world are not. So IID is, is jargon that stands for in, uh, independent and identically di di distributed. It's the assumption that everything is, is identical except by chance, which is the assumption behind all, all these statistical di di distributions like the Poisson distribution. But the real world is not IID. No person is like any other, other person, no village is like any other village. And ultimately, every extreme event is unique, and this uniqueness matters. So I'm from Canada, um, and uh, I was I was uh, in Britain by the time the, 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 this happened. But in, in autumn of 2012, uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New York City, which is not that far away from uh, from Toronto, um, and it was not an uh, unusual hurricane for most of its life, but most of them at, uh, head out to sea at this point. And do their damage for for the south, but this one took a very uh, strong left left curve, uh, westward steering, and then it also merged with an extra tropical storm and created what what was called a superstorm. Both of this, both the rapid steering and the and the merger with the were the result of a strongly deformed jet stream, and we don't really have any idea about how, how the jet stream might change uh, uh, under climate change. It was such a freak event that the US weather forecasters did, didn't even have a protocol for handling such an event. There's the National Hurricane Center, which will weather service, which makes the weather forecast. And um, there's a technical definition of a hurricane. It's to do with the symmetry, circular symmetry and so on. And the problem was that the forecast models were, were pr predicting that this storm would cease to be a hurricane just before it hit New York City. So the National Hurricane Center couldn't issue a warning, but the, there was no protocol to hand off to the, to the Weather Service. So they hadn't even imagined that a hurricane could tra transition into some superstorm, which is, I think, a good sign that no one had really thought it through. So it seems almost meaningless to ask if such a freak event would become more likely in, in the future. But we do know that sea level will be higher and the storms will hold more moisture. So you can legitimately ask, and I think plausibly answer the counterfactual questions, how much were the impacts of Sandy increased by climate change? How much worse might they be in the future? So there's a lot of interest now in this, in the tropical cyclone area. And I think this is also the case uh, for India as well. Now, the... Um, the tr traditional approach in climate science uh, is, is uh, I think, summarized by these, these two uh, quotations from the good practice. It's the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, good practice guidance paper on detection and attribution for anthropogenic climate change. It was published in 2010, but it's still the working guidance paper. 
And there's two quotes here that I picked out. The one is to avoid selection bias in studies. It's vital that the data are not pre-selected based on observed responses, but are chosen to represent regions of phenomena when re responses are expected. In other words, you should not base your, your, your uh, analysis on what you've seen, but you should base it on what your theories predict. And the second is that confounding factors or confounding influences should be explicitly and uh, identified and evaluated where, where, wherever possible. So uh, now both of these are, both of these are, if you could say, very orthodox science. This is the uh, a selection bias is a classic um, uh, concept in statistics and confounding factors, of course, we, we understand. But if you, if you, if you don't, if you don't base it on base your uh, analysis on what you've seen, and if you want to avoid places where there's confounding factors, like like the city, any place that's been under human influence, then the, you're really not able to talk about things at the local scale. So, with Adam Sobel, the, co the uh, author of that book, we wrote a um, a piece that came out of a um a interdisciplinary workshop. Um, uh, and we argue that the, these recommendations work against any consideration of the local. And Sheila Jasanov, who's a, a science and te technology scholar from, from India originally, uh, uh, has this phrase that uh, the process of abstraction and generalization in mainstream climate science de detaches knowledge from meaning. And I was at a workshop that was held out of ISIMOD, uh, the Integrated International Center for Integrated Mountain Development in Kathmandu uh, in the autumn, and there were participants from, from India. And Dr. Santosh Nepal, who is a hydrologist, uh, said at this forum that when he talks to, 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 to the farmers about the water resources, they say, we believe what we see and not what we're told, which is pretty sensible. Of course, we have to be careful about who, what we see. We don't, what we see isn't all, you know, there are there are cognitive biases and everything, but still, uh, that's very sound advice. But IPCC is basically telling us believe what you're told and not what you see, which I think is a problem. The most severe climate impacts, as you, I'm sure you realize, are often exacerbated by the human modified environment. This is an example of the, what's known as the urban heat island effect. It's uh, a study from The Hague, which is a city in the Netherlands. Um, and this is a map. You can see the coast. The uh, the the English Channel is is along the, the uh, upper left here, and so this showed the result of a heat wave in terms of temperature, and they plotted it against the city map. And um, as you not not surprisingly, the poor neighborhoods were disproportionately affected because they had fewer trees and more more concrete, more more built up environment. So rather than being uh, a, a confounding effect, climate scientists treat the urban environment as a confounding effect, and they want to look at, the, uh, at measurements that are away from cities. But the urban heat island effect is the threat multiplier. We actually have a huge amount of climate information, even, even, even at the local scale, uh, from both, both observations and modeling. It's just the, the information is conditional. So that's a point I'll come back to. Conditional. This is a, a plot I like to show uh, from uh, this paper, Zeitschek et al. It was based on the um, the summer heat wave in 2003 in, in central France. You may know that that was a really major uh, event in in, um, in Europe. I think 70,000 people uh, died. Um, it, so this 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 these um, the these images are from a small piece of uh, central France. It's shown in the image here. The scale is down at the lower right, 500 meters. So each uh, square is about three kilometers by three kilometers. The top row is the vegetation. It's, it's an index of vegetation known as the NDVI. And if it's red, it means that it's living. And if it's green, it means that, the, 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 that it's dead. And the lower panel is the surface temperature with obviously blue being the colder colors and red being the warmer colors. And the left column is one day in 2000 when there was no heat wave and the, and the right panel is one day in 2003 during the heat wave. Now you might think, how can I compare one day in one summer with one day in another year? You've got day-to-day -day climate, sorry, weather variability. You can't the the, the 
the, the two different days in absolute terms, but you can compare them in relative terms. And if you look across the scene here, this red patch on the, on the right hand side is a forest and the forest uh, didn't die. The forest was still there in the heat wave, including some edge rows that you can see here in red, but mostly the fields and pastures, all the crops died out. So it's green in this image. And when you have um, bare land rather than, than, than vegetated land, of course, the, it, it he, he heats up a lot more. And so the difference between the left and the right panels of temperature is 20 degrees C over the areas where, where, the, where the crops had died out, but only 11 degrees C in the forest. That's, that contrast is not just because of day-to-day -day weather variability, that's because of the difference between vegetation dying out and uh, the trees still being there. So that makes f physical sense. I'm sure you, would, you, under, you, you, you know that if you walk in a forest. Um, so we may not be able to predict the, the, the statistics of weak heat waves in the future, but we can predict their implications on how to manage their impacts. So in the end, we need to embrace landscapes. I have a math and physics background. Um, this is a very foreign uh, idea to me, but I was walking by the Royal Geographical Society in London uh, on my way to Imperial College uh, one day, and they had this poster up. They uh, said, every landscape ha has a story to tell. And I realized that for a geographer, let's say, this is a very natural way, way, to, way to think. So I think we need to embrace landscapes, not remove them. And there's a philosopher of science, Nancy Cartwright, who has argued that nature is any, anyway governed by a patchwork of scientific laws. So that's the way we have to put together this patchwork. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to do in my research now. Now, uh, scientists are pressured to issue single definitive statements. This is, there's a nice essay from a a Andy Sterling in Nature uh, 10 years ago. Um, but this shows a, a figure from a book uh, that's a textbook essentially now on decision making under deep uncertainty, which is a, 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 a evolving field. And they classify in this cartoon really the kind of de different levels uh, of uncertainty in between complete certainty on the left hand side and total ignorance on the right hand side. The um, most certain form might be, let's say, you're pretty sure what, what's going to happen with some error bars around that. Uh, alternatively, you have a, a wider spread with some probabilities, but the third level, you have alternative futures with maybe a ranking uh, between them. The fourth, you have a multiplicity of plausible futures and you can't rank them. And the fifth is just, it's unknown. So we need a, a language for expressing this, this right-hand side. The frequentist language is fine for dealing with uh, le uh, level one, not even level two actually, but level one. Um, I'm dealing with usually problems in levels three and four, I think I would say. So we need to find a language for, for, for expressing what Sterling calls a plural conditional state of knowledge. There are many methods for dealing with the deep uncertainty. I've talked about this book by Marshall et al. And here's a couple of references. So uh, coming to narrative, uh, I, I was struck by this quotation. St Stephen Jay Gould is a, was a very famous evolutionary bi a biologist. And he wrote this, uh, sorry for, the, for reading uh, slowly, but I think it's a, it's a beautiful quote. He says, natural historians have too often been apologetic, but, but most emphatically should not be in supporting a plurality of legitimately scientific modes, including a narrative or historical style that explicitly links the explanation of outcomes, not only spatio spatio-temporally invariant laws of nature, which is what physicists think about, but also, if not primarily to the specific contingencies of antecedent states, which have constituted differently, could not have generated the observed result. It's quite dense language, but if you think about it and uh, unpack it, it's very profound. So why not climate scientists too? And Lee, Lee, Lisa Lloyd, who's a philosopher of science in Indiana, I've been collaborating with her a fair amount, and we, we have a paper that just came out also in a climatic change where we talked about narrative in science and try to apply it to climate science. And this is uh, an image that for me, was very powerful from a flood uh, a disaster in Malamchi, which is uh, in Nepal, just north of Kathmandu. It's documented in this ECMOD report. This is an image uh, 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 from space of the valley here, uh, a rich agricultural, of Valley, and then there was this uh, 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 landslide event that led to, to to debris flow was very catastrophic, and the entire valley just got covered in uh, deeply in 
in sediment and and debris. This is gone. This agricultural land is now gone. I think you need a narrative. How else can you describe su su such an event except through a narrative? There's a lot of contingency in in this event. So that leads to storylines. And in this, this was this was a paper with about 20 co-authors that came out of a workshop, and we talked about different uses of storyline uh, concepts in, in in climate science. We and our, our definition there was a physically based unfolding of a past weather or climate event or of future events or pathways. And this definition actually is now incorporated in the IPCC glossary, and there's also a box in the working group one report on storyline approaches. So I think it's become now an accepted way of talking in climate science. And the different um, uh, topology, we talked about four topologies of use, partitioning uh, uncertainty, and this was a rain on snow event in, in the Swiss Alps where there was a cold front that came through in the autumn and it dumped about a meter of snow in the Alps. And then this uh, warm front came through and there was an atmospheric river, that's what the AR is tucked in behind. So it melted all the snow and rain. So that's called the rain on snow event. There was a local circulation known as a cedar feeder circulation, which is understood. It's a meteorological phenomenon. And you can see that the precipitation, this is in millimeters over 12 hours, was much higher on the upstream side of the value than on the, uh, on the downstream. But because this, this was such a local feature, this is four kilometers here, it was not predicted by the weather forecast models. Then you have risk, risk awareness, of course, from the impacts of a, a village was cut, cut off from the outside world for, uh, for several days, which in Britain, that wouldn't, that wouldn't shock people. But in Switzerland, that's, that's, quite, that's quite upsetting socially. And of course, they've been, they've been adaptation measures um, since then. So example I like to show uh, as well of an event is the is an Arctic event from Canada. Uh, this was a, a, a storm surge in the Mackenzie Delta on the Canadian Arctic coast 20 years ago already. Arctic change is happening very fast, of course. And this is again land uh, image from space. In this case, the fresh green is the freshwater species and red is the brackish or the saltwater species. And uh, you can see that uh, what was in 19. 87 was freshwater species got got inundated by this storm surge and became brackish. And if you look, and it ha hasn't come back since. And if you look at the lake sediments, which are at this site here, DZO 29, you, you can, um, it's shown that this was uh, unmatched in 1000 years. So this is really uh, um, a singular event. It's best described through a narrative or a storyline. And in the paper by these authors, a Pizarro et al, uh, they, they, they discuss all the different factors that could have been relevant. And uh, storylines provide conditional explanations. So I like to represent them in what are called ca causal networks, like shown here. So narrow just means, like what I was talking about with, with, with Pearl, uh, you know, uh, uh, element A can, 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 lead, can cause a change in element B. So in this case, you have uh, climate change, of course, which affects the open water season. Um, because there's been a decline in the, in, the, in the sea ice coverage in the Arctic, very, very strong, which means that the open water season is longer, which means that, that the uh, Arctic storms can act on that open water and create a storm surge. That can lead to saltwater inundation. That can be affected by rising sea levels. It could also be affected by the tide. And then you've got a uh, coastal retreat and the nature of the ecosystem will, will, will affect the damage. In that paper, interestingly, they don't discuss any, any statistical significance or likelihood. It's really a forensic approach to attribution. And with Lisa Lloyd, in an earlier paper, we had looked at the at various e ecosystem extreme events and, and found that they really always take this uh, forensic approach, which is very well aligned with, with the storyline approach. And in a different paper with Lisa, we also compared liability under tort law, a very different application and argued that storylines align well with that setup. So uh, you can talk about uh, different kinds of storylines. I shouldn't go on too long so I can take some questions. Uh, this is from the uh, IPCC. I, I said that it, it had been now uh, adopted in the IPCC and this is a figure in this, in this box talking about storylines with this causal network. And you can talk about an event storyline where you condition um, on or specify, which is in the dark blue here, the, the regional warming pattern and then dynamical uh, c 
conditions like a storm that leads to what's called a hazard, which could be uh, fl flooding or or, or 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 landslides, something like that, and then that leads to the to the impact, which involves the vulnerability and exposure, which are the human elements. Um, and what you can do this in various ways. This is with a student at the University of ha ha Hamburg, and we've been imposing the observed dynamical conditions in a climate model, but changing the regional warming with warmer ocean temperatures and increased greenhouse gases. It's actually used in regional climate modeling called the pseudo global warming, which I think is a bit of an uh, unfortunate term. So it's got a long legacy in climate modeling, but not for extreme uh, events. So here we use it for extreme events. And we looked at the Russian heat wave in 2010, a very, uh, uh, sorry, a very uh, serious event. And you can see that climate change, which is the difference between these two curves and was a couple of degrees uh, Celsius, you can follow, um, the, you get a very high signal to noise ratio in both space and, and time. The other kind of storyline is a dynamical storyline or circulation drivers, you might call it, where you specify a global warming level and then pull for, for your part of the world or Arctic amplification or the stratospheric vortex where I live. And this was the kind of storylines that, that, that you get there. This was to look at Mediterranean drying in the cold season, which is a very uh, serious climate of vulnerability for Southern Europe. And uh, as far as you know, any of these storylines could be true, but you see they have very different implications based on these different drivers. Uh, it might be that the drying is mainly over the Western part of the Mediterranean, or it could be that the drying is mainly over the Eastern part, or it could be both. So just, uh, finally, uh, uh, a couple of more sli slides and then I'll stop. So it, it's, I talked about the, 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 the decision context. So let me say, make a few comments about that. You can, you can readily embed climate impacts within causal networks. This is a figure, I'm sorry, it's very grainy. It's taken from this textbook by Fenton and Neil on risk assessment and, and decision uh, analysis. And they show the case of a, a dam burst and then a flood and how that might look from two different points of view. The one is the local authority. So from there, they're concerned primarily about loss of life. And the, the, the trigger is the dam burst. And then the, uh, the risk event for them is the flood and the control, which we would call the, which affects the exposure would be the flood barrier works. And the mitigant, which would control the vulner, which would affect the vulnerability, is the rapid emergency response. And the, the combination of these two will determine the loss of life. On the other hand, from a household perspective, the trigger is the flood. The, the risk event is that your particular house floods. The control, uh, which will affect your exposure, might be the sandbags you have around the house, and the um, and the, the vulnerability. Uh, uh, would would be the loss of capital from your house and the mitigant then would be the would be whether you have insurance. So I think the nice thing about this is it's the same kind of language, uh, causal network language, but you can you can represent a different storylines because everybody has a different per perspective. And finally, you can think about the the future this way. And as part of this de decision making under deep uh, uh, uncertainty um, approach, one of the methods is what's called the, the, the dynamic adaptation pathways. A paper I really like is is from uh, uh, Mario Lynn Hasnut in the Netherlands. That the, the Netherlands are very concerned about sea level rise, of course, um, because it's a very low lying country, and uh, and they're and they're concerned about the Rhine Delta and sea level rise. So. In this cartoon here, which is kind of a railway tracks, the idea is time goes from left to right and you have different actions which will work for a certain length of time. So action B, for example, which is shown in the, in the orange here might be a local adaptation measure. So action B might only take you so far, but within 10 years, it's gonna to cease to work anymore. And then you have to think about something maybe at a regional scale, a regional infrastructure measure, which is shown in, as action C in green here. But even that will have limitations. And at some point uh, down the road, maybe you need major land use change, which, which would be an action A and, A and D. But once you invoke the major land use change, then maybe you can bring in uh, local adaptation measures again. So it's a nice framework for looking at these the, the decision pathways. But then you have to imagine what kind of world you, you want to make sure that your actions are 
consistent that they're all all that you can switch these different pathways that it's actually possible so they just imagine four different kinds of worlds that you might um, think about um, managing sea, sea, sea level rise in Holland, like protecting clothes or accommodate. So to conclude, to address adaptation challenges, we need to navigate the cascade of uncertainty in climate projections and connect to the decision space. Now, it would, of course, it would be nice if we knew what would happen. Although actually, you could say if we knew what would happen, life will would be boring, but that, that's another topic. Anyway, we don't know what's gonna happen. And so the societally relevant question is not that, it's actually what is the impact of particular actions under an uncertain regional climate change? So if we frame the question in the, 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 the decision space, I think it opens opportunities. So for that, we need a language for describing plural conditional states of knowledge that exist at the regional and local scales. And then particularly, we must resist aggregation aggregation, which is to say co co combining things as a classic method in, in science to get uh, a, a stronger si si signal. But as I said, it, 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 it makes it meaningless at the, it takes away meaning from the, the local scale. In the end, we're all different. Every situation is different. Every context is different. We need to disaggregate. And the storyline approach to regional climate information does exactly that. Also linking to historical events, telling stories about historical events in their context brings a salience to the risks. Salience is very, is very important. It's well understood psychologically. And what I also like is that storylines provide a built-in narrative because the narrative is actually part of the construction of the, the, the theory. It's not contrived. You don't add it on at the end. It's actually built into the whole logic. And, but by having a narrative, it creates an, uh, an emotional element. And it's been widely shown that you need an emotional element for de decision-making. So we need to explore uh, storylines of climate risk, combining the best information from all sources, interpreted not as a prediction, but as representing plausible futures. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Shepard. For, and I completely agree that this uh, concept of storyline and narrating all these uh, things with the students. And I believe right from the school level, if it can be somehow be introduced, that mm. will be a game changer for all of us in that case. Yeah. So uh, your interesting talk has actually led to some questions which are there in the chat section. Would you like uh, to just look at them? And maybe okay. whichever you feel like you can uh, take up. Okay. Yes. So the first uh, is from Anil. Um, physical parameters, chemical. Yes, chemistry is certainly part of physics. I just use physics in a general term here. Uh, um, the climate models include chemistry as well. We have, of course, chemistry is part of climate change itself in terms of the greenhouse gases and so on. It's also part of the, of the impacts and part of air quality, so absolutely. I just use examples from the physical domain, but um, yeah, I, I used to work in the ozone problem, of course. So uh, absolutely, chemistry can, can be, and there's lots of, of course, a lot of observations of chemistry, a lot of fantastic uh, space-based uh, observations these days, as well as very good models. Okay, the Surin, uh, uh, oh my goodness, uh, lighting. Complicated. Well, I'm not sure I can fully. This is the one about uh, the study of Yanis et al. Um, I'm not going to be able to comment, I think, in detail on that particular study, but um, we do need to use, I mean, um, you know, regression has a funny reputation, I find. In some in some communities, it's seen as, it's, it's a very standard method, of course, and in some communities, it's seen as um, not a very sophisticated method, but I think actually, if you it, 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 there there is a danger if you do regression blindly that you just get results that you can't interpret, and there's a lot of data mining that will lead to false discoveries and this kind of thing. But I see regression and I'm trying to use it in my own work not as a way of di discovering relationships where I think there's a lot of um, potential false discoveries, but as a way of quantifying relationships. So if you bring your physical 
physical understanding in the form of a, of, a, of a hypothesis, which has been built up based on theory and models and so on, then you can use re regression to quantify the effects. And in particular, you typically have several um, competing effects that are, that, are, that are interacting. And in the example I gave, there were only three variables and one of them was either mediator or confounder. But in that article by Kretschmer, we talked about more, more, more complex situations with maybe six or eight variables and Pearl talks about such things too. And I think um, in the kind of problems that you're looking at, I think there would be multiple causal factors. And I think regression is, is a very powerful way to estimate the, the, the different factors. And we have to use um, some of these older, simpler methods are actually quite, quite powerful if you embed them within physical knowledge. Uh, um, if we compare natural resources, uh, can I comment on future changes in nature? I mean, we are not moving anywhere near fast enough. I think that's pretty obvious. Climate change is happening. No, it said climate change is happening faster than the climate scientists thought. Um, I'm not sure that's necessarily, uh, uh, it depends which climate scientists that, that, that you talk to. I think it's probably fair to say that IPCC has because it's a consensus document that needs a, a approval from all, all, all governments, that the IPCC has been fairly conservative. So I think if you say that IPCC has uh, underestimated climate change, that's probably a fair statement, but that's because of the political process that, that it's embedded in. But certainly if you look at, say, national uh, assessments or um, uh, assessments by expert groups, um, I don't think scientists are, are necessarily that that, that that surprised, but um, scientists are conservative, I think, generally speaking. And there are a fr there's a few that will uh, make stronger uh, predictions, but most of them are, are quite co co conservative. But I think it's very, very clear that we are going in the wrong direction very, very, very fast, and we have to make some changes very quickly. But I'm afraid that's not really my, 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 my area. I'm just trying to make sense of what's going on, because I think if you make sense of what's going on, that's the first step to maybe thinking about changes. Oh, I'm not going to get into the effect of Chinese dams on the Indian water supply. That sounds quite, quite political. Um, I will recommend, though, there's uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Unruly Waters uh, by, uh, um, uh, um, oh, shoot, I'm just, um, Sunil um, Amra. Su Sunil, Amrith is an Indian historian who's at Yale University in the US, and he's written a book called Unruly Waters, which is a history of the, of the South Asian monsoon for the last 150 years or so. So it brings in a lot of meteorology. Of course, he talks about water resources, um, the importance of the mountains and the cryosphere. He talks about some of the politics as well. Um, it's a, it's a, I really recommend that book. I found it, you know, a, a, it's a historian writing, but the, uh, the, the connections to meteorology and climate and, and glaciers and, and water are very, very uh, powerful. Um, so there is a lot of, you know, even it, it happens at every scale. Even in Britain, there's a court, there is a lot of wintertime flooding. It's part of the, uh, part of the natural uh, behavior. But of course, uh, because of uh, growth in population and so on, a lot of the houses have been built on floodplains. And in the north of England, where they get much more flooding than I do down here, uh, there was a case where one village built flood de 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 defenses, and it just meant that the next village downstream got, got flooded. So I'm afraid that our, our actions affect uh, our neighbors as well. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Schiffer, for taking up uh, all possible questions and even suggesting some of the readings for the students and for the faculty members. So on behalf of uh, the National Academy of Sciences, India Delhi chapter, and the host institution, the India Lupadhyay College, I would like to thank you once again for taking out time for us and enlightening all of us over here, those who are there. It's late evening in India, it's around uh, dinner time, but I must yeah. appreciate all the attendees who have been there with us uh, for this complete webinar. So I seek your permission to close the session for today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.